Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How do programs set up by the United Nations to eliminate the scourge of war, to promote, promote economic and social development, and to enhance human rights impact people in the United States and worldwide? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're going to take a look at the United Nations and the role it plays in helping to eliminate the scourge of war, to promote economic and social development, and to enhance human rights. My guest today is an expert on the United Nations and these particular goals and programs. My guest today is Mr. Steve Schlesinger. Mr. Schlesinger is a fellow at the Century Foundation in New York City. Steve Schlesinger is the former director of the World Policy Institute at the New School University. Mr. Schlesinger also authored Active Creation, Founding of the United Nations, as well as the letters of Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Steve Schlesinger, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate you being back. It's been a while since we've had an interview, and you've always got some very keen insight into what's going on with these issues and the role of the United Nations. Let's talk a little bit, very briefly, about the UN. And really, the UN came out of the ashes of World War II and out of the demise of the League of Nations. How important was it for an organization like the UN to be created in 1945 to deal with many of the problems of the really the post-World War II era? You know, you have to remember the atmosphere in 1945. The world had gone through two traumatic, horrific wars. The First World War, which 30 million people had died, and the, then the Second World War, another 60 million people had died. People around the world, governments, states, were just, you know, in, I as I said, in great ruination. They, they, they didn't know what would happen in the future. They were afraid of a Third World War. They were so determined to put together an organization which would prevent the outbreak of any new conflict. So the idea of the United Nations was a way of making sure that, that mm -hmm. there wouldn't be any more of these catastrophes. And therefore, they were very much you know, eager to put together the founding building blocks of this uh, great organization. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And of course, not too many years ago, you wrote a book on the United Nations, Active Creation, the Founding of the United Nations. And this has really turned out to be one of the most definitive books on the, uh, really, the formation of the United Nations, what led up to it, and the actual, uh, tr well, the events that transpired during the negotiations in San Francisco. How difficult was it to set up the United Nations in no 1945, and could we set up an institution like that today <laughs> if we had to? Well, it was difficult enough in 1945 when you had only about 50 nations. Uh, the, the one difference was that at that point, the United States was the most powerful country on earth. It was the one survivor mm -hmm. of the Great Second World War that could put together all these nations around a charter, which it itself had, the State Department itself had been the prime writer of that charter. And it was based on the old League of Nations, but it was a much more <laughs> centralized body than, than, than the League had been. But the most important thing was that uh, you had this eagerness to make sure that war would never happen again. Today, if you were to try to do it, imagine trying to get 193 nations together mm -hmm. around a new charter and now around a new organization. And you don't have war in the sense that you did in the, in, in the, dra the drama of the Second World War. It'd be much, much more difficult. I frankly think not only would it be almost improbable, but I don't think the U.S. Senate would probably ratify a U.N. charter today. And I think that's probably the worst part of the uh, equation we face in, the, in these contemporary times. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And now p our viewers can go to your website at www.stevenslesinger.com and get more information about what we're talking about today. In the United Nations Charter, there is no mention whatsoever of peacekeeping. But peacekeeping, since 1948, has been a pivotal part of the United Nations. Today, there are something like 16 peacekeeping missions, about 124,000 troops. 
in uh, 16 very uh, somewhat dangerous areas of the world, how important is it to have peacekeeping missions and to have them to try to bring stability to some of these civil conflicts or the war-torn areas? You know, it's one of the key responsibilities of the United Nations. Oddly enough, uh, you know, peacekeeping isn't even mentioned in the original UN Charter, but it shows the flexibility of that charter that out of the drama of the early years of the UN, the Security Council was able to come up with this idea of putting UN troops into conflict areas to prevent the outbreak of further war. Peacekeeping is absolutely essential to what the UN does. No other organization around the world can do this. And in from, from the purely the selfish American point of view, it means that American troops don't have to be sent out into these crisis mm -hmm. uh, situations. And we, ha we as a country don't have to spend money to, to underwrite this uh, situation in, in, in conflict areas. So from a lot of different points of view, it's a very valuable uh, contribution that the UN makes. But it's one of the many areas that the UN contributes in order to pr prevent the outbreak of further conflict. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, there is, uh, you, there are many advantages to participating in the peacekeeping operations. And of course, the peacekeeping budget right now is about eight billion, a little over eight billion. The U.S. shares a little over two billion. But that in comparison to what it would cost the U.S. if it were to be involved in, say, Haiti, for example, it, which we were there in the mid-90s and it turned it over to the United Nations. But it would be far more expensive for the United States to be involved, plus you put American troops on the front lines. And in many cases, as studies have shown, the U.N. can actually do, in certain conditions, a better job because they're more neutral. They can come in and be more objective as opposed to having one nation state uh, be responsible for a peacekeeping operation. So there, there are several advantages to having that. Oh, absolutely. And, and there, there's, a, there's an eagerness on the part of many of the developing countries to contribute troops to these UN missions because they want to show that they have this allegiance to the whole organization. And they do it. They, they can't contribute financially, but they can contribute human capital mm -hmm. to... to uh, help, you know, assisting the UN in, in, in its operations to, to prevent the outbreak of further conflict. Mm -hmm. Often when we talk about UN reform, we hear about the Security Council. Of course, there are six organs of the United Nations, the UN General Assembly with 193 member states, one state, one country, one vote. You have the Security Council, 15 members, five permanent members w with the veto, that can veto resolutions that are binding. What, uh, without going too far into the Security Council, we've been debating this issue, I remember back in the 80s, we were talking about how to reform the Security Council. What can be done realistically with the Security Council to make it a more efficient organization, perhaps a more equitable organization? Well, I would love to see the, the Security Council expanded, but right now, I I just from the very point of view of the five veto countries, that's uh, China, Russia, the United States, Great Britain, and France. There's v great resistance to any making any major changes in the Security Council. Y you have to remember that the issue of the veto was actually debated vociferously in San Francisco in 1945. All the smaller countries who came to the meeting in, 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 in that California city were furious that they couldn't get the veto too. And you know, in the old League of Nations, every country had the veto. But the fact is that Russia, at, the, at that time the Soviet Union and the United States, basically told the rest of the countries in San Francisco, if you don't give us the veto, we're going to walk out of this conference. And the smaller countries realized that without the United States and the Soviet Union in that organization, it was not going to fly. It would disappear the way the League did. So it was a kind of real politique that happened, and it was a compromise that has never been satisfactory to the rest of the membership. And yes, you're absolutely right. The issue of UN reform, particularly in the Security Council, comes up almost every year. Uh, and it's never really advanced. W at one point, the Security Council went from, from 15 members, uh, sorry, from uh, nine members to 15 members mm -hmm. back in, I think, 1965. But that's been it. And so far, there's some lip service that is paid by the five veto countries. Oh, yeah, of course, we'd like to see changes. But they never get around to doing it. And they they prefer having their privileges. It's, it's hard to change. It's <laughs> no very doubt hard about to change. that. Yes, that's very true. Well, the UN plays a vital role in many areas. We'll talk about some of those in just a moment. That uh, on dealing with programs and services that we never hear about, but they also play a critical role in diffusing 
problems, especially political problems. You think back to October of 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis, Utan, then the Secretary General of the UN, the UN being a neutral venue, so to speak, so that Ambassador Adlai Stevenson and the, his Russian counterpart and other players could come to the Security Council. That was a critical involvement of the United Nations in helping to defuse a situation that could have really annihilated a vast part of the Earth, because they were just one push of a button away, the red button, to setting off a, a nuclear exchange. So w what role can the UN play in this area? It, it, it plays a lot of behind the scenes activities, does it not? Yeah, I think the UN in the Cuban Missile Crisis showed its true colors, because it was the one organization which allowed the two uh, sort of foes in that conflict, the Soviet Union and the United States, to debate the issue openly in a form in which public opinion would be swayed by what was said in, in, in the statements by, in that, in that case, Adlai Stevenson on our side. And the point was that the UN, because it's a neutral arena, allows disputes to be settled in, in ways that no other organization can, can allow or, or permit. And w the other thing is the UN does is it has, a, it has emissaries that it sends out mm -hmm. In, again, in conflict situations. Right now, there's an emissary in the Syrian situation, in Libya, in, in uh, Ukraine, in a di number of different uh, mm -hmm. places where there has been either uh, semi uh, small wars or some sort of outbreaks of, 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 of conflict. And this is where the UN plays a vital role because, again, as the only organization which is, has credibility around the world, which which 193 countries have signed, signed the treaty and are bound by what, haps, what happens at the UN, it's, it, it, pr pr it sends emissaries that uh, represent the UN's ideals and trying to bring about peace. And again, if you look in the past, the 10, 20, 30 years, the UN has created peaceful settlements in places like Guatemala, El Salvador, Angola, Cambodia. I mean, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Where would, the, where would we be if the UN didn't exist? Because there's no other group or assembly that can work in that sense, in that sense to settle these, these outbreaks of violence. So the UN is absolutely critical and, and, and settling you know, these kind of uh, outbreaks on a regular basis is mm -hmm. one of the key, f key responsibilities of this organization. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to the website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you have any type of media outlet or you're involved with one, such as a website or PBS, Community Access Television, or any other type of outlet, you're invited to go to the broadcaster's page on the website and download the programs. Global Connections Television is a free public service that is provided to help people better understand how international issues impact our lives, especially at the local level. Today we're taking a look at an organization that touches our lives every day, and that is the United Nations. My guest today is an expert on the UN. My guest today is Mr. Steve Schlesinger. Mr. Steve Schlesinger is a fellow at the Century Foundation in New York City. He also authored The Act of Creation, founding of the United Nations, as well as the letters of Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Steve, we're talking about the United Nations and the critical role it plays, and uh, sometimes publicly, high, highly visible, sometimes behind the scenes, but it's often said that the UN is just the vehicle. It, the people who drive it are the ones who really are the ones who make it successful. Without the involvement of the P5, the permanent five members of the Security Council, or the other parts of the UN, the other uh, members of the General Assembly, the UN can only be as successful as its member states will work to make it successful. Can it not? I think that's absolutely true. I mean, first of all, you know, the UN is not a world government. Right. It doesn't have its own army. It doesn't have taxing powers. It wasn't elected by... Uh, in free democratic uh, s systems around the world. It's every country has a appointed representative, uh, and those countries can be dictatorships as well as democracies. So given the fact that, in a sense, it starts out as a weak organization, uh, it, it, what it does really have is a moral authority that no other group has around the world. And it, it, it can act only with the, uh, with the 
consent of, of, of its members. That's why in, in, in a place like Syria, we're not seeing very much action from the UN because uh, uh, several of the uh, permanent five members are vetoing any action in Syria because they have their own interests that they want to protect. So you do have to have a, a, a kind of collective security mm -hmm. notion in order to make this place work. And to the extent that the UN is able to bring parties together, particularly the P5, uh, you can get action. Uh, particularly, mm -hmm. for example, in the first Gulf War when, when the UN, after the fall of, of, of the Berlin Wall, finally came together and started to act the way the founding fathers and mothers wanted it to be, which was to act to prevent, the, uh, pr prevent aggression and do it with a collective spirit and collective troop movements uh, on the side of the UN. So that's, that's one example of where the UN proactively mm -hmm. did what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you, you really brought up a very important point with Syria, for example. When you think back two years ago when there was this stalemate, really, it, uh, in the Security Council with Russia and China not in favor of a resolution, uh, some of the other members being in favor, that you saw the 20% of the UN, the Security Council part, the General Assembly part, that part, and then the other 80% of the United Nations, the humanitarian programs, operating in Syria. The World Food Program is on the ground, the UN Children's Fund, the High Commission for Refugees, the World Health Organization, <laughs> all on the ground helping people stay alive every day, to be quite honest, and to get them out of harm's way. But it, there are, you have the political arm, the 20% of the UN, I guess, and then you have the 80% of the humanitarian arm that we don't hear much about. We really don't read much about the World Food Program on the ground in Syria. Now, the media concentrates on what the Security Council decides. That's the that's the group, that's the unit in the UN which makes war and peace decisions, and mm -hmm. so it's much more exciting for press coverage. Uh, whereas dealing with refugees or hunger or mm -hmm. the outbreak of, of uh, disease is far less exciting to the, to the uh, media. And, and you're right, the UN really, I would say 80% of the UN is about those, issue, those areas that, that we don't really hear very much about. But you would not imagine that if you were to read the papers on a daily basis. You'd think the Security Council is the only thing that's important at the UN. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If we think back to 2002, 2003, to the run-up to the Iraq War and the invasion of Iraq, and we recall that really the United Nations had played a critical role back in 91, 92 to make sure that Saddam Hussein did not have nuclear capabilities. Dr. Hans Blix headed up that UN team at that time that stripped him of uh, nuclear capacity and then went back in with the UN verification mm -hmm. team in 2003, I guess it was, and the UN was really ignored. Uh, Dr. Blix, who I had a chance to chat with, said that he thought Saddam maybe had weapons. They went in with their team, talked to the experts, went back to the factories, followed the, the clues, and there was no evidence whatsoever, and they were right. They were absolutely right. But still, when they came back, we saw that there was so much misinformation, disinformation put out by the, by the Bush administration, other groups like that, the Neil conservatives, that they wanted a war, and they were going to have a war, and they went forward with it. But should the media, and I remember Dr. Blix got like one day of coverage by the media, should the media have talked to him and <laughs> talked to somebody who really knew what was going on on the ground instead of a bunch of folks who really had uh, their own agenda as far as starting a war? And it was an illegal war on top of it. Well, it, you know, you're absolutely pinpointed a real crucial weakness of the UN, which is that when, you have a, when you're a major power, you can get away with violating the terms of the UN Charter. And the U.S. did so when George W. Bush uh, authorized the invasion of Iraq without getting prior S Security Council or l l legitimacy for doing that. I know it was the Security Council never played a role in, in deciding whether to go in or not. And, and Hans Blix and his investigators never had a chance to, mm -hmm. to finish their probing into whether there were weapons, we weapons of mass pr pr uh, destruction. Had they been able to finish that mission, they would have been able to show there was no reason for the uh, U.S. intervention in Iraq. So one of the, this is a weakness that I've always kind of felt this great difficulty dealing with in the U.N. because it's not just the U.S. in its invasion of Iraq, it's China taking over the South Chinese Sea Islands, which they have no particular claim on. I mean, there are other mm -hmm. countries in the area that have claims on. It's the Russians 
going into Crimea without any authorization for the Security Council. So they have three countries which are major members of the P5 acting outside the UN Charter. How do you deal with that in the future? That's going to be one of the real challenges mm -hmm. for the organization in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It is, if we go back to Iraq just for a moment, we recall, too, that uh, former Secretary General Kofi Annan, as well as the majority of the member states of the United Nations, did not believe that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. The majority of the people around the world, according to the polls, didn't believe it, but they were not involved in the discussion they were basically shunted to one side so are we are we follow are we following in those footsteps are we about to make some of the same mistakes as we look at Syria right now or maybe even people even though we got a very good agreement with Iran right now to make sure Iran doesn't go nuclear but we're hearing the same arguments from the neoconservatives the same illogical ideas <laughs> that failed in 2003 they're talking about today are we uh, trying to go down that same road have we not learned anything I tell you, the difference today is that there, you have to concede that, at least in Washington, there's more emphasis on no negotiation and diplomacy than there ever was in the Bush years. And therefore, you do have this agreement now that there is going to be a, a conference in Geneva, I think January 25th, which is going to be an attempt to somehow bring in all the regional powers as well as the major P5 powers in, that, in Geneva to try to bring some sort of uh, early contours of an of, of accord which would damp down the violence in Syria and maybe lead to a, a long-term agreement, might lead to a, uh, you know, a, a, a allowing uh, uh, the president of Syria to stay in office for a bit longer and then have him step down and then have democratic elections. I don't know if that can materialize, but that's certainly the effort, and that's all being undertaken by the United Nations. So, you know, in this case, it's clear that Washington wants to defer to the UN and let them get involved. That was not the case under George W. Bush. And I think that is a big difference between what happened in 2003 and what's happening today. Mm -hmm. And of course, we were talking a little bit before about some of the services provided by the United Nations. We hear about the peacekeeping, we hear about the Security Council, but so often we do not hear, <coughs> excuse me, about these services, for example, uh, UN agencies that help to move aircraft safely in international airspace to make sure the aircraft is not uh, uh, taken over by a right. uh, terrorist or whatever the case might be, or to make sure that airliners don't crash into one another, or ships on the high seas. Again, the International Maritime Organization, a UN agency, works to bring the shipping lines together. The UN helps to disseminate weather information around the world, to work with postal authorities, to move mail around the world. This is the really the silent part of the United Nations. How can, can we get, encourage the media to start focusing more on some of these vital services that impact our lives every day? You know, you've, you've, again, you got your finger on a very important point, which is that without the UN, how would you sort of regulate all the different things that go on around the world so that countries would have common standards by which they would approach airline safety or maritime safety or, or issues of health and so on. You realize that the UN has promulgated over three or 300 treaties which are international in scope, which have been signed on by most of the 192 countries that are members of this organization. Those treaties really are the basis for international law. If, again, if you didn't have the UN, where would international law uh, come from? And, and therefore, I, once again, the media is missing one of the main points of this organization, which is to give a kind of, you know, solidity and legal framework to the way the, uh, the globe operates in a way that keeps mm -hmm. safety for all human beings. Exactly. Steve, the hardest question, the last minute we have, we're almost out of time. What can the UN do to be more efficient and more effective? It's not a perfect organization, but one or two suggestions very quickly. Well, I, I think it, it should continue doing what, for example, it did in global warming, having these conferences bringing countries together. It should continue to do uh, sending out these emissaries to help settle conflicts around the world. It should continue to try to make sure that, that there are peace treaties that are, that are respected and that, that countries don't have to indulge in internal war in order to, to protect their interests. I think in the future it might be something to, to consider for the UN to have a rapid reaction force, which would mean that it would be able to bring in troops automatically within a week or so, even within a few days, 
to damp out, uh, you know, violence. That's a kind of controversial issue, but it's something they ought to address. Another issue is financing the organization. Uh, all these countries make voluntary contributions. It's never enough for the UN budget. Maybe there are ways of, of you know, actually asking that financial transactions around the world be taxed to, to underwrite the organization. So there are a lot of issues that are endemic to making an organization continue and survive. And, that, and, and, and I could go on at length for, <laughs> no, for many more. The, very good. But Steve Schlesinger, author of Active Creation, founding of the United Nations, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television. Thank <laughs> you.